Working with Couples Using ISTDP Principles A Brief Overview of a Few Basic But Important Concepts and Applications ISTDP-Inspired Couples Therapy as taught by Marvin Scorman and elaborated and expanded upon by Johannes Keating. Dr. Davenlu, who developed Intensive Short-Term Dynamic Psychotherapy, ISTDP for short, developed a model for individual therapy, and he never worked with couples. However, because emotional closeness and emotional intimacy is so central in ISTDP, and also generally both the prime objective and central source of conflict in relationships, Davenlu's model can be adapted to couples work. Part of the therapist's job is to model intimacy so the couple understand what healthy alternatives are to distancing behaviors, defenses, what those alternatives can look and sound like. Unlocking of the unconscious can happen spontaneously as the couple will naturally mobilize each other's feelings and there is a time and place to nudge the work towards that experience. But an unlocking of the unconscious should never be aimed for the way we might an individual ISTDP. The couple itself is the patient, not either partner. Unlike individual ISTDP, where the aim is character change and helping the individual get to the bottom of neurotic suffering, in ISTDP-informed couples therapy, we accept that both partners have to use a down-to-earth term, their craziness, and we simply aim for helping the couple have a more satisfying life together. Having said that, character change often does occur as restructuring of channels of anxiety discharge and of maladaptive defenses tends to take place. The ISTDP-informed couples therapist can work in the transference, but again, not typically with the aim for unlocking the unconscious. But the transference work here can serve the function of regulating anxiety, yes, and perhaps most importantly though, it can serve the function of identifying and resolving misplaced defensive blame and making resistance against emotional closeness conscious and ego dystonic. And now for some very much oversimplified and very far from exhaustive applications to illustrate key concepts. Ah, uh, but I get ahead of myself. Uh, first, a brief list of overlapping concepts when it comes to individual ISTDP and couples-informed ISTDP. First then, inquiry into the phenomenological descriptive nature of the couple's difficulties, clarification of each partner's position and point of view, the honesty around the consequences and implications of their positions, we sometimes call that the head-on collision, and the experiential here and now focus on feelings and defenses. Mind you, defenses that get in the way of emotionally intimate relating between the couple. Now, combined with the teaching of skills through modeling and the therapist's running commentary of what the healthy, emotionally intimate alternative to distancing might look and sound like. All of this constitutes the cornerstone of ISTDP-inspired couples therapy. Looking at an ideal couples therapy session by way of illustrating some basic concepts. The couple declare a problem that can be helped by couples therapy. The couple either describe the problem and or the problem becomes manifest in real time during the session. This is a common occurrence. So whether the problem is occurring in vivo or simply is being described, the therapist helps each partner see what they are or were feeling and how they dealt or are dealing with those feelings in ways that contribute to emotional distancing as opposed to dialogue and emotional closeness. Enter Lisa and Joe. 
therapist to Joe, who is appearing highly anxious. So you're angry at Lisa. Just explain to me what you're angry at her for. The invitation to have him turn to the therapist and explain why he's angry at Lisa serves to lower his anxiety by turning to the therapist and not to Lisa and also engages his self-reflective functions, which also reduces anxiety. I can't stand it when she babies Luke, our son. He doesn't need to be coddled. She shouldn't be doing that. Is his tone is exasperated, and he rolls his eyes. Lisa looks withdrawn. So you're angry at Lisa because you don't like how she engages with your son Luke. And if you don't like it, you don't like it. I'm not here to tell you that you should not feel what you feel. But do you notice that you deal with your anger by adopting a scolding tone, like you're talking down to her? Yeah, I guess I am. I'm just really frustrated. I understand. I'm not taking issue with your anger and frustration. But how is it working out to deal with your anger and frustration by talking down to her and telling her what she should be doing? Well, it's obviously not working out well. She withdraws, and we don't talk for days. Would you like to learn how to express your anger in a way that may bring the two of you closer, as opposed to further apart? I sure would. What if you just told her that you feel angry at her, that you're concerned about her approach to Luke, and that you understand that your opinion isn't be-all, end-all, but that you'd like to talk about your concerns? Do you think that might make your life easier to just say that? It may, yes. If he said that to you, instead of what he said when he was left to his own devices, would that make your life easier? It'd be like I died and went to heaven. Okay, then. And Lisa, I noticed that you've been withdrawn today, and you've both suggested that you pull away outside of here as well. What are you feeling towards Joe right now? I don't like it very much when he talks down to me. Well, why would you like it? So what do you feel towards him when he talks down to you that you understandably don't like? Well, irritated. Okay, makes sense. And how is it for you to deal with your irritation by shutting down and withdrawing? Not great, but I don't know what else to do. Do you have reservations about simply telling him that you're irritated with him when he talks to you that way? I'm not used to that, but the idea of saying that, it feels good, maybe a bit uneasy. Do you think it could be withdrawing and not talking for days? I do. I'm pretty tired of that. Okay, you're tired of that, and you think being upfront about your irrit irritation may be an upgrade. Joe, what, what would feel better for you, that she shuts down and withdraws for days, or that she tells you that she's irritated with you when you talk down to her? I would much rather just hear about that she's irritated than getting the cold shoulder. Does that mean that you think it's reasonable for her to be irritated with you when you talk down to her? Sure, I wouldn't like it either. Well, that feels good to hear. I'm not used to having how I feel be validated. Okay, and though you understandably do not like it when he talks down to you, given that he has concerns about how you approach Luke, do you think his anger is reasonable? I imagine it may touch on Joe's own past, which I know a bit about. So yeah, given his past, and if we are talking about just how he feels but not how he deals with it, then yes, it's understandable. Okay, so you're both saying that if you both express yourself in a more emotionally intimate way rather than in a distant way, and if the other is supportive of your feelings, uh, that this would make both of your lives easier. And both of them say, yes, definitely. So there seems to be a lot of common ground here. You both prefer to be emotionally intimate to distant, and you both want your feelings to be acknowledged, which was not possible when you were being emotionally distant. The couple says, yeah, we see that. What you're suggesting and showing us, it feels much better. The couple reach out and hold hands with a warmth that wasn't there before. 
A conscious therapeutic alliance has been created with this couple. Each partner has gained insight into interpsychic causality, what we in ISTDP call the triangle of conflict, and bought into the idea of turning against their defenses and being emotionally intimate instead. The therapist helped each see how they dealt with their anger and irritation, how it was working against their own interests, and then the therapist modeled an alternative that involved emotional intimacy rather than emotional distancing. Having each of them acknowledge that the other person's feelings, not at all necessarily how they dealt with those feelings, but the feelings themselves, given who the person is, what they've been through and what's important to them, that those feelings are reasonable. They're valid. This is a crucial component to the emotional intimacy piece. Now, of note, though conflicts around negative emotions are very common, it's not just negative emotions that are important to attend to and elicit in couples therapy. Positive feelings, from tenderness and sexual feelings to excitement and joy, are just as important. It's also important to note that when the therapist asked, do you think this could make your life easier? This was an important way of ensuring that each understood that I was not proposing that either of them do something just to please the other person, but that in actuality the proposed communication truly would be better for each of them individually. This underscores the importance that each partner understands that they're not being asked to do something for another at their own expense, but that what is truly in their own best interest, that that is the therapist's focus, with the idea that this is also likely what's going to benefit them as a couple. Getting to this place of a clear and strong conscious therapeutic alliance is usually not this easy or straightforward as each couple's dynamics are often complex and defenses often impede treatment. In line with the principle of creating a conscious alliance and driving home the point that they're not asked to change to please the other, it can often be helpful for the therapist to help each partner see that the issues that present themselves to be worked on in couples therapy are issues that they would probably want to work on for themselves, regardless of whether or not the relationship continues or not. So dealing with your anger by withdrawing and becoming passive predates Joe and would continue after Joe with the next person, unless you resolve this way of dealing with your anger. Would you want to work on this for your own sake, regardless of how things end up for you and Joe? Same thing with Joe, helping him see that he would want to work on how he deals with his anger for his own benefit, really regardless of Lisa. And now, onwards to the next topic. Working in the transference as a way of making resistance against emotional closeness conscious and ego dystonic. Imagine that Joe and Lisa are more resistant and guarded. I'm miserable, and it's really Joe's fault. If only he treated me better, I'd be fine, not, not so lonely. I can't tell him how I feel. I mean, he's a jerk. I see. How are you feeling towards me right now? In a dismissive tone. I'm fine. It's not important. Notice how dismissive and distant you are with me now. Am I being a jerk to you? Well, no, no, you're not. And yet, you're keeping me at a distance as well. You're not clear and open with your feelings towards me either. And I'm not talking down to you. Okay, yes. So Joe makes a good cover for you. You can point to him and blame him because he really does talk down to you at times. But we see that this is just how you are in relationships, because you're distant with me as well. Did your misery and loneliness start when you met Joe, or did you ever feel that way prior to meeting Joe? No, of course I felt that way a lot in my life, even as a teenager. 
Again, more indications that you can't pin your loneliness and misery on Joe, isn't it? This predates him, and you're distant with me as well. And I'm not being a jerk to you, and you agreed to that. I see what you mean. Like I'm using Joe's bad behavior as an excuse to keep him at an arm's length distance? It appears that way to me. What do you think? And what do you think, Joe? Yeah, I think it's true. I'm really glad to be seeing this. I know I shouldn't be talking down to her when I do, but I always felt like I was getting too much blame. So this is actually music to my ears. A head-on collision. Imagine for a moment that Lisa and Joe are getting very defensive. Usually one partner is more defensive than the other in a given moment. But let's imagine that both are talking past each other, scolding and lecturing each other. This clearly jeopardizes the therapeutic progress, and the head-on collision is needed. Do you see how this has stopped being a conversation? You're talking past each other, lecturing each other, and as long as you continue to do this, no therapy happens and you remain alone and battled and at odds behind your walls. Do you really want to spend the rest of your session like this, defeating the very goals and priorities that brought you here? This snaps them out of it. One at a time now. Let's start with you, Lisa. You sound angry. Just explain to me what you're angry at Joe for. And Joe, you will get your turn. But if you overshadow Lisa's feelings by jumping in before Lisa is heard, we won't get anywhere. So we will need to make that a separate conversation. But I promise you'll get your turn. Does that sound okay that we start with Lisa and then we make your feelings, Joe, a separate conversation? The rule of thumb here is that whoever appears the most upset should get the first turn, and that in order to avoid a tit-for-tat situation, there needs to be clearly delineated, separate conversations. Or imagine that Joe is belligerent, combative, and he does not easily snap out of it. Here, the therapist will need to be firm, repetitive, and refuse to engage in content. You're still doing it, Joe. You're still on attack mode, and when you're like this, I cannot be helpful to you. I want to help you with your feelings and help you be understood, but that is not possible when you go on the attack. He continues, You're still doing it, and I still cannot help you. If Joe persists, at that point the therapist would need to turn to Lisa and ignore Joe, and simply relate to the person still capable of dialogue. When one partner does not find their distancing behaviors problematic. Imagine that Joe feels justified in talking down to Lisa. I'm angry. Of course I talk down to her. She deserves to be spoken to in that way. I appreciate your honesty. I'm afraid that this is what you'll have to live with. He does not aspire to change how he deals with his anger towards you. Are you willing to live with this? I don't know. Are you thinking I should leave him? That is a personal choice that only you can make. But I'm thinking that whatever you decide about the relationship should factor in that this is how it's going to be. This is how he is. And it's not likely to change since he sees no problem in talking down to you. Here, a conscious alliance and consensus on what constitutes a problem does not exist. Rather than trying to force an alliance, the therapist ought to simply point out the absence of common ground around what constitutes a problem and therefore that it's not likely to change. The task at this juncture becomes one of helping Lisa open her eyes to the fact that her partner does not wish to change anything about himself, and she needs to be prepared to accept his behaviors or leave the relationship. Parsing and making sure the other only gets their fair share. Let's say that Joe's anger towards Lisa appears really out of proportion in intensity. It's important to elicit the source of the intensity of Joe's anger. One way to do that. Joe, I'm not taking issue with your anger towards Lisa, but it has a certain intensity to it that makes me wonder if it has historical antecedents. Does Lisa, Baby, and Luke remind you of anything or anyone? Has there been something similar from your past that also angered you? If Joe can see the historical roots of the theme of what angers him, P on the triangle of person in ISTDP jargon. Say, for example, his younger sibling was giving the nurturing attention from his mother that he never got, but always wanted. 
It'd be important to validate Joe's anger and hurt, but also to help him see that Lisa does not deserve all the anger she's getting, and to help Joe parse his anger. Joe, percentage-wise, how much of this anger belongs with Lisa and how much belongs with your mother? If I'm honest, I think 40% is you, Lisa, and 60% is my mother. Excellent job parsing that. So how about when you feel this intense anger towards Lisa? You let her know that only 40% of it is really directed towards her, and the bulk of it is for your mom. Gosh, that would make it so much easier for me to hear, and it'd make me want to be there for you, Joe. Why didn't I think of this? I'm sold. I'll try to parse my anger from now on so you don't get more than your fair share. In conclusion, there are countless more dynamics that often arise in couples therapy, but hopefully this brief and very far from exhaustive illustration conveys a sample of a few important concepts and a sense for ways of engaging and working with couples therapy format from a perspective inspired by ISTDP principles. For more information, visit johanneskeating.com.